Uh, I talked to him. He said they went out fished yesterday, didn't catch anything. But uh, that's why they call it fishing, not catching. Uh, anyway, uh, they're having a good time, him and Miss Kelly and the kids. And uh, I'm going to fill in tonight. Been so long, I forgot what I'm doing, really. I'm mean, kind of not, not used to doing this no more. Amen. Okay, so look at um, the prayer requests. Everybody got a prayer request. I appreciate them fixing these nice prayer requests up. And uh, look on the front. We're not going to go through a lot of the individual requests. Um, we do have some uh, salvation requests. Uh, Ralph Howard is my cousin, my first cousin. And we, I've been trying to chase him around and talk to him for about eight months. And uh, he, he, he talked to me the other day. And uh, when I get back from Wyoming, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go down there and see him. And he's going to let me gonna spend a little time with Mr. Pray for him. He's not sure he's saved. Uh, who is Earl Howard? Anybody know who Earl Howard is? And I've got a cousin named Earl, but it's Strickland. It ain't Howard. He's Rouse. I reckon somebody might have got mixed up and thought it was might be my cousin with the wrong name. Amen. All my cousins need Jesus, I tell you. Uh, uh, you know, all the, how many of y'all's cousins need Jesus? Say amen. Yeah, okay, yeah. On the back, we got a whole list, again, of uh, old prayer requests there. And uh, just don't don't take these for granted. You know, Brother Jim Hellams doesn't brag about this and doesn't tell it, but every night for years, Brother Jim takes this list and one he's got that is about three times bigger than this list, and he prays every night night and I mean he pray, it takes an hour or two to go through all that list and uh, and uh, that's a blessing I'll tell you now also be, be, look below it there uh, all of our missionaries are listed we've uh, we're excited about what the Lord is allowing us to do financially lately uh, we, we I think that's all of ours if there's 31 of them on there it's all of them and uh, we're excited about that let's see if they added let's see Daniel Sparks Peter Reddish Press, Brother Raji, uh, one, two, three, I see three they added on, four, five, six, yeah, okay, yeah, that's all of them, amen, so uh, pray for all of our missionaries, this pandemic, you know, it's been hard on us here in America, but it's been really hard on our missionaries, it's really, a lot of them been in these countries around the world that just really, uh, have clamped them down, put on crazy uh, restrictions and shutdowns and all, and uh, they've stopped them from having church. Some of them, they've stopped. They've stopped some of our missionaries from going into town and witnessing and doing stuff like that. So it's really, of course, it's loosening up some now. And if they don't put, I mean, I've, I've got a theory. You might not disagree, but I think they've done this themselves somewhat. I think I'm a conspiracy theory on this. But if they don't put something else in the public, uh, maybe we'll be okay for a while. Amen. And hey, Brother Greg, how you doing? Good to see you, buddy. Amen. Brother Greg is going to teach my Sunday school class Sunday. I asked him to. Uh, we're leaving Friday morning to go to uh, Wyoming. We was going to go to Montana and go to Glacier National Park, but I caught there last night, and they've had 16 feet of snow the last two months. So... Uh, had to have a snowmobile or whatever, amen. But anyway, pray for us there, if you will, on that trip. Anybody else got any prayer requests you want to add? Anybody want to make, uh, Lindsay? I have a little girl that used to be in the daycare where I work. Yeah. How uh, how old is she? Seven years old. And what's her name? I got a pen here. Hang on a minute. Hang on a minute. I can't have her. You got to holler at me, kind of. Clark's the last name? Ariana. Huh? Ariana. Okay, amen. I'm from the old school. We named them Tom and Ed and Susan. Amen. We didn't, 
We didn't, we, we didn't have these names they got now, I can tell you. Uh, where, yeah, James. That's your second voice. What do we call that voice? I forgot his name now. James has two or three voices. He really does talk that way. And, uh, you know, but uh, anyway, who was it? Your mom. Pray for James' mom, Miss Rita. And uh, anyone else? Anyone else, Chris? Rob Morris. I'm going to tell you something. I don't see some of y'all writing. I'm going to tell you something I learned a long time ago. If you don't make a list, you won't remember it and pray for them. Hey, Diego, how you doing? Huh? One of my bus kids out of Little Mexico. Hey, Amen. Good to see you, buddy. And I hear you want to go out there with us. Well, we need somebody who can speak Hispanic. We really do. Hey, Amen. All I know is burrito and taco. Hey, Amen. Uh, you know, Brother Doug. She's been missing. Yeah, they can't find her. There's no word from her. She's a strong woman, but uh, her name's Cherish Rand. Okay. So she's been missing for a while now, then, for a few weeks or whatever. Okay. Let's pray for Cherish. Yeah. Anyone else? Anybody else have any? Pray for Brother Jesse, Miss Kelly, then. They're down in uh, Stain Hatchie, down there in Florida. And, uh, my cousin called me a day from Blackshear, Georgia. I said, what are you doing, Mike? He said, I'm sweating like a hog. He said, it's 93 degrees and 78% humidity. I said, I don't miss that at all. Somebody say amen. But pray for Brother Jesse and them, you know. And uh, they're coming back Friday. Uh, but they're coming back Friday. I talk to him every day. Uh, Y'all don't know about some of it. We've been getting him some books and buying him some books, trying to, you know, it's kind of hard to find good books, and, you know, you read these modern-day writers, and it's, you know, don't get me started. Uh, there's a lot of great older books out there from men of God, and uh, you can get them on Facebook and Amazon and some of them things. We've been buying him a good bit, really. Uh, we bought him, like, I think we bought him, like, five boxes of them. He called me yesterday excited. He's reading M.R. DeHaan on the tabernacle. And he said he got so excited they almost had a church service he about preached to them. He said, I can't wait to get back and preach what I'm reading. So pray for Brother Jesse that Lord take care of him and get him ready for Sunday. Okay, let's pray. Let's, let's have a couple of men pray. Um, Brother Greg, why don't you, if you don't mind, why don't you just stand right where you are there? Why don't you lead us in prayer? Brother Jeremy Wallace, why don't you... Uh, I ran into a guy that works at Jordan there, and he was bragging on you. I said, y'all don't know him, evidently. I mean, I'll be honest with you. He's my son-in-law, amen? Brother Jeremy, you close. Brother Greg, you start, if you will, for us. Yeah. Uh-huh. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Lord, we pray, Lord, for this campaign through Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. 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 Amen. Yeah. 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 Yep. Yeah. 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 Amen. Bless your name, Lord. Yeah. 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 Yes, Lord. Yeah. Help us, Lord. Yeah. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes, we do. Yes, we do, Lord. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 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 Amen. Yeah. 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 Amen. Yeah. 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 Thank you, Lord. Bless your name. Mm-hmm. 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 Yes, you are. Yes. Amen. Yeah. 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 God help them, Lord. May she show up and be safe. Yeah. Yes. My cousins, Lord Earl and Ralph and Vicky and a number of them I'm worried about, Lord. Yeah. Yeah, please. Please help us. Fill me, Lord. Yeah. Let me preach in your power. Yeah. Yeah. Please. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. You may be seated. Turn in your Bibles to Second Chronicles chapter 20, if you will. Um, like I said, Brother Jesse asked me. And now listen, you need to pray for me. I'm trying to pass my real estate state license exam. I go in the morning to Macon at 9 o'clock. And I have been racking my brain for about six days and nights now. And when you're 67 years old and you hadn't been to school in 40 years, uh, it's never easy anyway, but it's flat not easy when you're when you got cognitive problems, as they call it now. Somebody said, "What is cognitive problems? Just some intellectual pauses we old people have. That's what it is. Not senior moments. It's intellectual pauses. Amen. We're just pondering on things. It's just taking us a while to realize what we were to say next. Amen. Thank you for being here. Ain't it exciting what God's doing in the church? I mean. Just, I've been telling everybody about it. I was talking to a preacher friend of mine today from uh, Jacksonville, and I was telling him about the people being saved, and he's already heard about it. He heard from another friend of mine, and uh, somebody went on Facebook and watched a couple of our services, and uh, I want to thank, thank you to Patrick again. That was his baby, his idea. It wasn't mine. Um, I'm technologically challenged. I've had a smartphone for eight years, and I just figured out how to use half of it, maybe. I was talking to a real estate mega agent in Atlanta the day I may be working with them, and she said, how are you technologically? I said, if I have to be good technologically, I'm going to quit because if you, if you want me to be that, we're in a lot of trouble. I can sell dirt to a farmer. I can sell ice to an Eskimo, but technology in me is just not my greatest trick. She said, well, we can teach you. I said, well, I got, I got some grandkids that can help me. Somebody say amen. But pray for that. I'm, I really have. I'm, I'm, I burnt my, my brain right now. <laughs> There's 2,700 questions and terms, and uh, I might preach on VA loans in a minute. Amen? I don't even tell them what I get talking about or whatever. I want to preach tonight. You know, I preach... 40-something years, and I sat down months ago and tried to figure out approximately how many times I've preached through the years, and probably between five and 6,000 times I've preached, uh, at least 5,000. I'm sure more than that, really. But I used to worry about, you know, oh, Lordy, I want everybody to walk out and say, what a preacher, this, that, whatever. I really just want to help you now. I really got past worried about my outlines and 
all that stuff. I don't, I don't even use outlines, number one, and never happened in years, really. But, um, but I just want to help somebody. And I want to preach tonight. I don't normally title my sermon, but the reason I'm going to title it tonight is because I want you to get the main point that I'm trying to get across. How many of you sometimes feel like you're undermanned? Anybody feel that way? Uh, okay, three people did. The rest of y'all, just the rest of us sinners, you know, we, we uh, I feel under man often, you know. Uh, how many of you sometimes feel like you're going up against something that you're not really equipped to defeat? You ever feel that way? I mean, sometimes you just, you look at the obstacles and you look at the circumstances and you just sit there and go, whew. I mean, I've been walking the last few weeks. Okay? They gave me a shot in my knee, and I've lost 50 pounds. I reckon that helps, too. Or lose 50 more pounds, I'll be healed, I reckon. But uh, I went down there to Herman C. Michael Park the other day, and uh, it's a two-mile walk around it, you know. And I did okay, but I didn't know which way to walk. Everybody knows which way to walk. You really start by the soccer fields, and it's downhill. Well, I started by the tennis courts, and that is uphill. And I got, I got about halfway to the soccer courts, and I said, wow. I mean, this would be bad. A pastor dies, heart attack, walking up by the soccer fields. Uh, I mean, and that last big old hill, the soccer fields like this, you're down there where the pond is, it looks like Mount Everest. And I just said, you know, I can't call nobody. I can't get in my car. And I sat on the bench for a minute, and I said, Lord, I've got to get up that hill. I didn't really think I could, to be honest with you. I mean, I really didn't. I mean, I worried about my heart and breathing and all that. But anyway, we made it. But do you feel that way sometimes? So, sometimes you have things ahead of you, and you've got to do it, or you're trying to do it, or you think you need to do it. And, and, and you, you, you come to church, or Brother Jesse gets fired up, and he lets, and I'm going to tell you, I'm going to tell you all something. The man's preaching really good right now. And uh, I ain't bragging, but I know what good preaching is. I've been around preaching 50 years. All right, Brother Jesse Bragg is preaching really good right now. And the Lord is on him, and we're being blessed by that preaching. And uh, But, you know, you come to church, and you get fired up, and... Oh, yeah, I'm gonna, I tell you what, I'm, I'm going to read my Bible and I'm going to pass out 25 tracts and, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to lose weight and I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. And then you get, Brother Todd, I know some of y'all remember the sermon. How many of y'all were here when Dean McNeese preached the sermon, Why God Allows the Enemy to Hang Around? Any of y'all remember that? I do. Well, the dean said, you'll get all fired up in the church service, get, get gunned up, ready to go, and you'll make God promises, and you'll just be excited, and everybody's shouting and praising God and smiling and blessing you and shaking your hands and hugging you. And he said, you get out to the car. Huh? He said, and he said, here's the devil right there. Here he is on the car. saying, well, come on, big boy. You're so fired up. Come on. Y'all remember? I remember that. He said, just come on. Yeah, yeah you're going to set the roll on fire, D.L. Moody Jr. You're going to get it all done, ain't you? And you know what happens to all of us? You get intimidated. See, when we went up to Mark Shroud's uh, camp meeting and heard a great sermon on the lines, and I'm not critiquing the guy or criticizing him, but the biggest point of the line roaring, do you know what line roars? Anybody know which line roars? Not the young warrior, and not the young cub, not, not the ones hunting. The old lion roars to keep you away from him. That's, that's a fact about lions. Well, that's what the devil does. Let me tell you something where you know it or not. Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. Do you know Jesus has met the devil numerous times and the devil's never got the best of him. He thought he did at Calvary, but that didn't work out too good, did he? He thought he did at the, at the temptation, but that didn't work out too good either. He thought he did when he had these guys, these, these demoniacs and all full of devils, and he walked up to them and everybody was scared of them, and, and they were scared of Jesus. 
Matter of fact, one time they said to him, one of my favorite verses in the Bible is when that demon says to him, have you come to torment us before our time? Now that didn't excite you, but I got cold chills on me when I said that. You know why? Because he knew when his time of destruction was. That demon, <laughs> that demon knew one day Jesus go throw him in hell for good. So he says to him, have you come to torment us before our time? Huh? So, so we, we have so much greatness in God in us. I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. I mean, not, not, not some things, Doug. All things. Brother Nathan, I'm not talking about most things. He didn't say I can do most things. He didn't say I can do almost all things in this real estate thing. One thing you learn about real estate, and I promise you you learn this, if it ain't in writing, if it ain't 100% clear, you're in trouble. You know what I mean? Well, he told me, no, that don't mean nothing in real estate. Do you hear me? You better have a contract, you better have some signings done, and you better have some paperwork saying, I am doing this. So the devil loves to intimidate us. And he loves, in in Woman is Guide to the Bible, I I preached it a number of times years ago. One of my favorite lessons in that book is the 15 D's of the devil. I I can remember a lot of them. Um, Distraction, disillusion, discouragement, depression. Those are all D's, destructive D's of the devil. But I, you know what I think the biggest one is, and I really do, and that's doubt. What did he do to Eve? What, what did the devil do to Eve? Did he come to her? What did he do to her? He made her doubt. He said, Psst, Eve, yea, hath God said? He didn't say Eve. God didn't say it because he can't say it because that would make him a liar and God could have zapped him again. But what he did say, he could say, yea, is that what God said, Eve? And what was placed in her was doubt. And I'm telling you, when doubt is placed in us, it can paralyze you. I mean, I learned, you, you, you know... Uh, I'm, I'm 67 years old, done so many things in my life. God been so good to me. But at so many times I've learned that you just have to go for it. And you know what? Sometimes you're not sure what you're doing. Huh? We started this church and I stood at Timothy Elementary School looking out a glass door. And I didn't know if anybody was going to come. Because, see, we didn't start this church on a split. We didn't steal a bunch of people's church members. We didn't, we didn't build this church on that. I didn't know anybody. Didn't know anybody's church members. Didn't know anybody. And I'd talk real brave, and God was going to do it. I can do all things. Ah, 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 ah. And I stood there that Sunday morning, I remember, looking out those two glass doors, and the devil and my flesh, guess what they said? It's 9.48 and ain't nobody here, Ed. You're going to fall flat on your face. How are you going to build a church in an area you don't even know nobody? Do you know how stupid what you're doing? You say, he don't say that to me. Well, he does to me. And you know what's bad about it, Christopher? My flesh jumps right in with him. Somebody say amen. My flesh bails out on me every time. I mean, every time a demon of hell, every time a bad thought comes, I wish sometime my flesh say, no, get back. My flesh just jumps right in and says, that's right, Ed, that's right, Ed, that's right, Ed, that's right. Doubt. Are you listening to me? Doubt. So what do you do when you're undermanned and you're outgunned? My favorite story, my favorite story, of all war stories, is in World War II. And I, I knew the guy's name, but his, his, his name has slipped me now. But we had a young colonel that had a battalion of men 
over somewhere in France, and they were really in trouble. I mean, really in trouble. So much trouble that General Patton said, he won't make it 24 hours if the Germans know how much they got him outmanned. And we can't get to him. We ain't got time to get to him. It'll be a slaughter. So the German commander sent the note to him by a a courier. And the note said, so-and-so, so-and-so, just surrender. We'll come in. We won't kill you. We won't won't hurt you. We'll give you a warm place. We'll give you food. Just surrender because you can't win this thing. He sent them back. Does anybody know what word he sent back to It was a one-word sentence. He wrote it in real big letters, and he put it on the paper. He handed it back to the courier, and he said, go give him this. Anybody remember what it was? I I mean, I know history ain't taught like it was. I know that, but nobody remembers what he said? Nobody remembers, really? Come on. What now? Nuts. You're nuts. He called the German commander N-U-T-S. You're nuts. And then he sent some way when they didn't. He sent one to Patton and said, we're surrounded on all four sides. We've only got one option. That's just attack. And he did. And he held on for 20, 38 hours and they got help there. Now, when you're outmanned, when you're undergunned, Undermanned, outgunned, whatever. What do you do? Second Chronicles 20. I'm, I'm not going to take the time to read it. I, I ain't going to take 15 minutes of my preaching to read right now. I'm going to tell you what happened there. You can read it at home if you want to. We're going to read a few verses. I want to preach the thought to you more than read 35 verses to you. Okay? I'm going to tell you what it says. Jehoshaphat is the king. There are some bad enemies around him. I mean some strong enemies. I mean, and Israel, at that time, Judah under Jehoshaphat, had probably as weak an army as they had in the entire kingdom. So chapter 20, verse 1, we'll read just a couple of verses. It came to pass after this also that the children of Moab and the children of Ammon. By the way, I ain't going to preach on this, but anybody know where Moab and Ammon came from? Hmm? Lot and his daughters. Remember that? Remember there's two sons born? One of them was Ammon. One of them was Moab. Amen? So here we are now with Ammon and the Moabites here. So it came against Jehoshaphat to battle. There, then there came some that told Jehoshaphat, saying, There cometh a great multitude against thee from beyond the sea on this side Syria. And behold, they be in Hazon Tamar, which is in Gedi. Now, I ain't got time to show you, but if I had a map, that really means they're right around the corner. If you looked on the map where in Gedi and all those places are where the Israelites were, they were almost on them. So, the reason I said that is Jehoshaphat had no time to do nothing. He could not get his army properly retreated. He had no protection if he retreated. If you look at at geography, he had no option but to stay where he was. If he ran either way, he becomes like picking off rabbits with a shotgun or whatever. So they say they're on us. They're right here. They're in Hazazon Tamar. Boy, I'm glad we got stayed in my Bogart, ain't you? I like our names, I'll be honest with you. Verse 3, keep, let's go in just a minute. And Jehoshaphat feared... Now, where's he at right now? Okay, now keep this in mind. He's got an army. <laughs> I wish you had time to take an hour or two here. He had an army that was undermanned by number. They were outgunned by resources. It really should have became a slaughter. If you humanly looked at it, 
And the Moabites and the Ammonites at that time were two of the strongest three armies in the world. And they were sitting there getting ready to come on him. And he had nothing to do except one thing. What did he do in verse 3? The Bible said he feared. And he set himself to seek the Lord. And he proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. Give me verse 4. And Judah gathered themselves together. You know who Judah is? There, the, it, this was during the divided kingdom of Israel. You had Judah and Israel. Ten tribes were Israel. Two tribes were Judah. The righteous, the righteous one had Jerusalem as a capital, and that was Judah. By the way, anybody know where it says Jesus came from? What tribe, huh? Judah. He was a lion of the tribe of Judah, the righteous ones. See, in Israel, as they was known back then, their capital was Samaria in the enemy's country. Judah's was Jerusalem, where it should have been. But Judah was smaller, a lot less equipped, and longer from their home than Israel was. They couldn't run. I'm trying to get you to see that. Sometimes you can. Sometimes you need to. But they couldn't. They couldn't outrun them. The terrain they'd have to run through, the route they would have had to take, they'd be dead in the water, I promise you. Be like knocking them, what's them things you go to check your cheese and them things poke their heads up and you. What a guacamole. Yeah, I like, I like guacamole. How many of y'all like guacamole? Amen. I love guacamole. I don't know about guacamole. But the Bible says they gathered themselves together to ask help of the Lord. Even out of all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. And Jehoshaphat stood in the congregation of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court. And I'm reading too much. Give me one more verse. And said, O Lord God of our fathers, art not thou God in heaven? And rulest not thou over all the kingdoms of the heathen? And in thine hand is there not power and might. You know what he does? He looks up to God and says, Oh Lord, here's how powerful you are. You're the only hope we have now. We're outmanned. We're outgunned. We can't run. We can't attack. To attack our frontal attack would be disastrous. They'd beat us to death like a rag doll. He didn't say ragdoll, that's South Georgia. That's what he said. Now, here's my, here's my question to you. Remember the title of the sermon, What to Do When You're Undermanned and Outgunned? What do you do? What do you do when you look at something that looks like a mountain that you just can't climb? What do you do when, what do you, do when you look at something and go, boy, it would be good to do that, but I, I don't know. I, I don't think I have the power. I don't think I have the resources. I don't think I have the knowledge of how to do it. See, look at me. That don't matter anyway. See, your power don't matter anyway. Your knowledge doesn't matter anyway. Your resources don't matter. See, it is, it, you're, you're, it, it, be honest with you, you're not going to defeat the Ammonites on your own. You're not going to beat the Moabites. You're not going to beat the Arabians and the Geshemites. You're not going to beat them. They're in their country. They've got the resources. They've got the knowledge. They've got the manpower. They've got the weapons. But you depend on God. And God can do some awesome things. And that obstacle that looks so deep and so high and so big, God can do it. I like that song, Beth and Miss Kelly. Somebody sings, I know God is big enough. See, see, church, listen to me. Listen to me. We fear the demons of hell somewhat. We fear the world somewhat. But Jesus doesn't. Are you listening to me? He doesn't. Do you remember when he was in the bottom of the boat? And the storm was tearing them up and throwing the boat everywhere and it was just going crazy. What was he doing? 
He was what? He was sleeping. Whoa, now wait, wait, wait a minute. Oh, Lord, I mean, don't you care about us? We're going to perish. He cared so much he was asleep. All he did was get up and walk out there and just go, shh, and they laid down. See, church, what do you do when you're outgunned? What do you do when you're under man? What do you do when you bit off more than you can chew? Have you ever done that? Anybody ever, ever bit off more than you can chew? I think about silly things when I'm preaching. I say things. I had a cousin that was about 50 pounds bigger than me, about 6'2". And one day I was convinced I could whip him. I bumped my jaws at him. I mean, I aggravated him two or three hours. He finally turned around. His name was Dennis. He said, will you leave me alone? I said, no, you ain't man enough to make me. He hit me so hard. I promise you, next thing I saw was Daddy standing over me. And I got stars and everything. You can chew, you can just bite off more than you can chew sometimes. Sometimes you can jump out here, you know. I mean, we're we're from Florida. I was always we've gone to beach so many times. I mean, I, and it's amazing sometimes. I mean, how you just walk along there and it'll be three foot of water and everything's fine. Especially in North Florida, where we go. I mean, it's not like South Carolina, some of them places. It's got deep drop offs and bad undertow. You can just walk out there two or three feet, be doing just fine. Next thing you know, you're over your head. Then, next thing you know, an undertow is pulling you with it. Do you know what you do when you're caught in an undertow? Anybody know? You swim with it. You swim with the undertow. I've done it about 10 times. You don't fight it, you just swim with it. It'll pull you out. It's got enough strength to. I'm just thinking sometimes. I've jumped over my head so many times. I mean, I've, I've jumped out there. Okay, God, I'm going to do this and I'm going to do that. And I tell you what. Attack. Jump out there and you look around and go, I don't know about this. If you're doing what God's telling you to do, you're fine. Because you got all the resources in the world behind you. You got all the strength in the world behind you. I mean, look what he said. I love what he said here. He said, Aren't you the God in heaven? Yeah. Don't you rule over all the kingdoms? Well, yeah. I mean, in your hand, there's enough power and might that there's none that's able to withstand you. I mean, God, he, he just said, Lord, you're really great. And right now, I need that greatness. We're not going to take the time to read the rest of it, but they win. The Moabites and Ammonites go back to their little place with their heads between their legs. Israel gets the victory, and they're able to go into a land, and they're able to set cities up. They're able to do great things. I think one of the biggest battles we fight is taking a step. I mean, taking a step. I mean, you, you ever been? Yeah, have you ever been to water somewhere and you really wanted to go swim, but you you don't know if you want to, and you play around in the edge of? That's the worst thing you can do. I can tell you what I do. It's just my nature. I dive in head first. If I come up, fine. If I don't, fine. What you got to do sometimes? Sometimes you just got to say, Lord, I believe you want me to do this. Lord, I believe you want me to be right here. I believe you want to give me a victory. And it doesn't look good. And I don't understand everything and, and depression and anxiety. And, and do yourself a favor and don't be ignorant and belittle those things. Please don't be ignorant because you've been blessed enough not to fight them. They're really real. I'm just telling you they are. And it's one of the worst feelings in the world. When you're paralyzed and you don't understand why you're paralyzed. And you don't understand why you can't get up and do what you should. And you don't understand why you're so stressed out and, and typed up and your chest is hurting and your head's hurting and you just you can't sleep and you can't 
Don't, don't belittle that. I'm just telling you, don't belittle that. Number one, you're probably young, and one day you may be there. Hope not, but one day you may. But when you get to a place, you just got to go for it sometimes. I mean, Jehoshaphat said, you know, I can't run. I can't do anything. I've only got one option. And the one option is to depend on God and his power and his strength and his resources. And God, you know, God's going, this is good preaching even if I'm doing it. Do you know what God's going to do every time you do that? Huh? Let me ask you a question. Do you really think God's the kind of God that's going to let you get it there and saw the limb off behind you? Do you really think God's just going to say, look at that fool down there, Lord. Just let him go, you know, let him fail. No, I don't believe he is. I, I believe sometimes, and I, you, I mean, I can't prove he says this, but you can't prove he didn't, so I can say it. I believe sometimes, I, I believe the Lord, but the sometimes probably say, I know about me, does. I know. When I get to heaven, my guardian angel is going to slap me so hard. It takes me a thousand years to get up. I know the Lord sometimes has said, Ed, Ed, angel, look at him. He's bouncing out there like a rubber ball. For me, for me. So let's go help him. Amen? Amen? That's what God will do every time, I believe. Every time you do something for him, every time you take a step of faith, every time you take on a, a thing for him, every time you go after something for God, every time you step out there by faith, every time you give it a shot, I don't believe God's ever going to let you down. I don't believe he will. I mean, really, I don't believe he will. I think he'll say, well, he stepped out, believing I'll do something. <laughs> so let's go do something. It's just that simple. I mean, Diego, I look at you, and I'll close with this. Maybe, maybe not. I'll be gone for a couple of weeks, so you, don't, you can't get on to me now, amen. I'm looking at you Sunday, Diego, and I was thinking about how we started our bus ministry. You wasn't at the beginning of it, but I started it in my car. Old Burgundy Beast. How many of y'all remember the Burgundy Beast? There's a couple of y'all around. So why did he call it the Burgundy Beast? 446,000 miles. I mean, the paint was wore off the hood. You know how the stuff inside falls down. Don't you hate that sometimes? It gets in your hair and your ears. I mean, you're riding down the road and you roll the wind down. It looks like a balloon riding down the road. I mean, I mean, it's stuff. <laughs> and I called Bobby Robertson in Walker Town, North Carolina. I said, Brother Bobby, this is Brother Ed Strickland in Athens, Georgia. He said, yes, sir. I said, uh, we got a problem. He said, what you got, Brother Ed? I said, I want to do a bus mission, but we had not got a bus. And we had not got any money to buy a bus. <laughs> we really don't. Matter of fact, I mean, I didn't take a salary the first year and a half of any kind. I mean, I we put it back in the plate and tried to get some money up to get us a place to meet and everything. And I said, we don't have the money. We don't have the bus. He's dead now in heaven. But I'll never forget this. He said, let me call you back in 30 minutes. 30 minutes, my phone rang. He said, Brother Strickland, Bobby Robertson. I said, yes, sir. He said, how quick can you get up here and get a bus? I said, I got a CDL license. I said, I'd just get somebody to ride with me. I'd go get it. He said, give me a couple of days. I want to put new tires on it. I want to change it. Oh, I want to tune it up. I want to clean it inside, put some new seats on it. And I want to give it to you. We run that bus 12 years. All over the area. I believe when you step out for God... And don't doubt so much that the obstacle and the mountain look so big that I don't know why I'm even trying this. I'm going to tell you this turtle story again that I've told 600 times, and I promise you I'm true. I'm really through because I'm hungry. 
I hadn't ate none since this morning. I used to eat every two hours. Now I eat less. Right now my stomach's threatening through my, my back's threatening to through my stomach for lack of support. The little boy's on the beach. And see, we go to Me Island every year, and on the north end of the beach ever, I think it's August, maybe, maybe July, but they raise turtles, the little turtles, and they, they, they hatch them, and they, they put little protective things on them. That is crazy. Isn't it? You can kill a baby, but not a turtle. Don't get me started. Let's protect the turtles, but let's kill the babies. Are we messed up? Are we messed up? But I'm not exaggerating now. If you mess with one of them turtle places, I'm, I'm serious. They will arrest you. I didn't say they'll get on to you. They'll put you in a police car and put you in jail if you mess with one of them protected turtles. So what happens is they hatch. But they hatch up on the beach away from the water. Because you can't, I mean, you couldn't live where the water's coming in and out. I mean, that's just two plus two. So they get hatched up on the, the beach goes up, and it erodes some, and it's up like this. And they got about 50 yards to make it to the water. You say, what's the problem? Predators. You know what else is on the beach in Florida all the time? Birds. You know what birds eat? Fish. Turtles, anything comes out. Half of them don't make it to the water. That's the numbers. Then what said it, by the way, when they make it in the water, there's predators in the water that eat them. They estimate that one out of four turtles makes it to become an adult. And there's millions of them that hatch. Stories told about an old man standing out on his, his beachfront house. He sees a little boy on the beach. He sees him running all up and down the beach. He can't figure out what he's doing. So he gets his flip-flops or whatever on. He goes down to the beach. And the closer he gets to him, the little boy's wore out. And he's breathing deep. And he's running all over the beach. And he's throwing turtles in the water. And the old man said, son, what are you doing? <laughs> I'm saving turtles. He said, my daddy told me that when they get hatched, they don't make it to the water. He said, the birds eat them and the animals eat them and people kill them. And he said, I just thought I want to save some of them. Here's, here's the point. Here's the kicker. The old man says, son, there's me. There's millions of them. You can't save them all. The boy's standing there. He's wore out. And he says, no, sir, I can't. And he picked up a little turtle. Picked up a little turtle. He held it and he brushed the sand off of it, you know. <laughs> Blew all the sand off. And he walked out to the beach and he threw him in the water and he turned around and said, but I saved him. Are you going for it? Are you letting doubt, distraction, discouragement keep you from going for it? Can I tell you this last thing? You know how to never get criticized? There's, there's a sure way to never get criticized. Did you know that? Anybody know the answer? How do, you, how do you live to where you're never criticized by anybody? You don't do nothing. D.O. Moody was bringing kids in the bus. I mean, not bus. Didn't have buses back then. Bring him in Chicago, giving them pony rides on Saturday, and he'd give them hot dogs and pony rides, and he'd teach them Sunday school. They'd get and save. He's brought so many of them to the church. The deacon said they're messing the church up. We don't want the riff raff in here. Dio Moody said, That's okay, I'll start my own church. But a guy came to Moody one day and they called him Crazy Moody, and the guy said to him, Hey, Crazy Moody! You're crazy. He said, Probably. He said, I don't like the way you're reaching them kids. I think it's terrible what you're doing. He said, well, how are you reaching them? Show me a better way. And the guy goes, well, I'm not reaching them. He said, I like the way I'm doing it wrong better than the way you're not doing it at all. America has been built on pioneers and people who went for it. 
outgunned, undermanned, out-resourced, terrible scenario, surrounded by hundreds, they they estimate 100 to 200,000 Moabites and Ammonites. He had like 20,000. But he went for it. Every head bowed, every eye closed, no one looking around. You know, this church has been built on that, and it's been built right now on that. Brother Jesse is aggressive. I mean, about any idea you come to with him, it ain't really crazy. He, he wants to do it. He wants to try it. He wants to go for it. Let's give it a shot. Let's try it, preacher. Let's go to it. How do we do it? What do we do? Do you live out of way, or do you live real safe and comfortable? Do you? kind of scared to step out and do things see you're scared hey hey, by the way last statement I'm making I'm, I'm shutting up don't be scared of failure Thomas Edison was told you fail making a light a thousand times he said I never fail one time I learned a thousand ways not to do it how do you think about failure you're going to try something, you'll fall flat of your face. You're going to try something, it won't work out right. You're going to try something, you'll have bad times. You're going to try something, you'll have failures, you'll have victories. But the victories are worth the failures. I promise you. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for the privilege tonight to preach. Hope we've said something to help somebody. It's really all I care about at this stage of my life. Lord, you know that. Does somebody get help? Somebody get fired up? Lord, this church is on fire right now. You're saving people every Sunday. You're changing lives. People are joining the church because our pastor is going for it. And Lord, that's what we need to do. Outgunned, undermanned, outresourced, looks impossible. But with you, all things are possible. With every head bowed, every eye closed, I, I, can't, I can't close without doing this at least. Is there anybody here that might say, Preacher, you know you preached about going for it in the Christian life and you, you preached about the goodness and greatness of God tonight and, you know, I don't know if I died, I'd go to heaven, Preacher. See, we've, we've seen people saved on Wednesday nights now for months, haven't we? You can't just get saved on Sunday. You can get saved on Wednesday. Our pastor got saved on Wednesday. I got saved on a Friday. You ain't got to be Sunday. Anybody here like that? Just raise your hand. We'll pray for you. Okay, I know I preach to Christians. It's it's, it's a challenging message to believers. Real quick, I want to ask you one question. Did the Lord help you tonight? And you really want to go for it? There's probably some of you sitting here right now in your seat. And you know you ought to be teaching a class. And you know you ought to be working in a bus route. You know you ought to be helping when the young people are singing in the choir or cleaning the church or watching the nursery. You know because the Holy Ghost has already talked to you just been fighting it and resisting it and putting it off let's stand if anybody wants to come to the altar we got Diego coming already anybody let's stand if you will anybody want to come to the altar and I tell you what to tell the Lord just say Lord I want to go for it come on I want to go for it I don't want to stand on the sideline. I don't want to be a Monday morning quarterback I don't want to be a Monday morning fan I want to go for it If I fail, if I fall, I'll just get up. Jack Howell said, what makes a man great is not his victories. What makes a man great is not the things that he does right and great. What makes a man great is what it takes to stop him. Amen? What it takes to stop you. You're going to fall. You're going to fail. Just get up. Just get up. 
My dad put so many good things in me now that I'm six, seven years old. But I think one of the best things he put in me is don't quit. It would have been easy three or four years at Grace Baptist Church ago when everybody was throwing the dirt on us and it looked like we was going down for the count. It had been so easy. I promise you. But I'm not a quitter. I wasn't raised to be a quitter. My dad used to say to me 5,000 times, son, you don't never lose till you quit. You never lose till you quit. When you quit and give up, you lose. Amen, Diego. Amen, Brother Brian. When you're through praying, just slip back to your seat. Whew. may look up, if you will. We're going to say a word of prayer and be dismissed. Thank you for being here tonight. I hope we helped you some. I, I'm really serious, church. I, I'm really nervous. I'm really tired. I got, I'm going to study four or five hours a night. I really need the Holy Ghost to put, make some of them things right that I get wrong. Y'all please pray for me. How many of y'all pray for me tomorrow morning, nine o'clock? Let me see your hands. Some of y'all ain't even going to pray for me. That's fine. That's okay. I know who'll be there with me. Jesus will. And what I'm hoping is, I'm gonna tell you something. They got you gave you four. They give you four choices, and I'm gonna narrow it down to two, like I did the other day. Some, and I'm gonna say, okay, Holy Ghost, it's one of them two. Poof. Amen. Hey, say, so what are you gonna do if you fail? Take it again. Cost me two hundred dollars, but I'll take it again. Let's have a word of prayer. Thank you for being here again. Good service, good crowd. Pray for our pastor and his family. They get a safe trip back, and uh, God takes care of them. <sighs> Brother Les Owens, you mind praying for us?